The scripture for the message that I've chosen today is Psalm 32, and I am um, reading it from the new, new uh, let me see, the New Living Version. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you, and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Therefore, let all the godly pray to you while there is still time, that they may not drown in the floodwaters of judgment. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit and bridle to keep it under control. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord. So rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. Shout for joy, all you whose hearts are pure. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So today I want to speak about feelings. Now I'm not going to go into any psychotherapy mode. Don't worry about that. If I was to do that, I should speak with each one of you viewers and the people um, who will be attending worship um, personally, individually. And that would just take too long. Um, secondly, I am not trained for that at all. But I have recognized in the words of Psalm 32 that David discussed many different feelings and attitudes. He does, he does so in so many of the Psalms that he has been, um, has done and that they've been accounted to him laments, and praises. But for today, we are going to look specifically at Psalm 32. I hope that, and I encourage you that if you have to stop the video to do so, but to have your Bible alongside, because I'm really going to be referring to verses today. The first emotion comes immediately in verse 1 when David speaks about himself, most likely, but addresses it as a plural. And he says this, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is out of sight. So that feeling is joy. And who doesn't like a feeling of being joyful? We speak to the joy of Christ's birth at Christmas, and we speak to the joy that we have in the Lord who gives us strength. You know, we even sang to it in the 1970s. Yes, I'm that old. When we sang about Jeremiah, who was a bullfrog, and the chorus to the song went like this, singing joy to the world, all the boys and girls now, Joy to the fishes in the deep blue sea, joy to you and me. How many of you ever sang that song? Or at least had the words go through your head? Well, I did, and it made me feel good to sing it back in the 70s. The joy that David is speaking about today goes much deeper than the lyrics of a song that talks about an imaginary bullfrog drinking wine. 
The joy he speaks to is the joy that we get when we know that our wrongs have been forgiven and forgotten. They are out of our sight. You know, I spoke to this earlier in August when I spoke to the words in Joel and stress that when God forgives our sins, he forgets about them, and we should too. Verse 2 reminds us that we have joy because the Lord has cleared us from the feeling of guilt. It is a joy to know that life is wonderful when we are cleared of guilt because of God's forgiveness. It's like calling the sinner a prisoner because of what he has done. And that is what we are, prisoners, until God clears our record. And then, having learned our lesson, we need to live a life of honesty. There are a number of reasons why people hold back in confessing their wrongs. I get it. Certainly, pride can be a factor. Sometimes we just do not want to admit that we are wrong. At other times, we might withhold confessing our screw-ups out of despair. We are so overcome with guilt for our sins that we don't believe God can possibly forgive us. I don't know if this is a case that affected David, but regardless, he found himself holding out on God. He was no longer on speaking terms with his heavenly father. Studies show that a majority, the majority of physical aches and pains and sometimes conditions that even affect our major organs have been manifested by the amount of guilt that people carry emotionally. There was a time in my life that I carried tremendous guilt, and I'm here to tell you that it affected me physically. The stress of it caused me to have no appetite, to, to um, lose weight. It affected my appearance. My outlook on life was not the way it should be. I lived what they are speaking about in verse 3. Again, I called it stress. That is a feeling. And I think David felt that feeling too, the feeling of stress. Have any of you ever felt that way? In verse 4, David speaks about the heavy hand of discipline. David feels weighted down. Now, Ed and I, are, our whole family really are kind of what you'd call wrestling fanatics. Our grandsons are in youth wrestling now. Our two sons wrestled, and now we follow Minnesota Gopher and SDSU Gopher or, uh, wrestling as well. This heavy hand of discipline made me think of the wrestler who is fighting to get out of a wrestling hold that has him feeling defeated, and he continues the squirming and the fighting. Guilt and unconfessed sin have caused us to wrestle with discipline. And God's hand can get very heavy, and consequently, we feel weaker and weaker. Our strength, as the scripture says, evaporates like water does in the summer heat. Friends, if you are living with any type of unconfessed guilt that is weighing you down, know that God forgives. David tells us what he did in verse 5. Finally, it says, finally I confessed my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. To which I say, hallelujah, we can have what David received. 
Verse 6 contains words of another feeling of David's. It's concern. He is speaking to anyone who is living a life of guilt when he has so much as said this, pray to God while there is still time. Do it before the judgment when it will be too late. I remind you, yes, I remind you people that we are on a timeline. It could be too late sometime soon. Verse 7, did you catch the feeling in verse 7? For you are my hide, you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with the songs of victory. Well, if if you focused on the word protect, yes, that's the feeling I'm talking about. Protected. This made me think of another illustration, and it kind of made me smile. All three of my grandsons have red tablets. They're about this big. They're kind of like little mini laptops for kids. And they do educational games on them and um, exercises that their parents have downloaded. Occasionally, they were able to watch cartoons or a movie that has been downloaded. Well, they also have these headphones that plug into it, each one, and they're able to each do their own individual things. Well, let me tell you, when that's happening, they cannot hear anything, anything that's said by any adult. And they just kind of curl up and they're watching. They cannot sense any danger. They appear to feel very safe. They feel protected from the outside world. They are in their own protected spot. They know that their parents are watching over them. And we, friends, can have that same feeling of protection when we are aware of God's protection over us. And then, as Scripture says, and then as our faith and our assurances deepen, and grow, we are aware of the songs of victory that are ours. There's a lot of songs of victory in the Methodist hymnal, and the one that I chose to end our service today is about eternity. It's when we all get to heaven. We'll sing that after a while. What comes next provides a feeling of assurance. Such an important feeling to possess. Two weeks ago, you heard Ed's testimony, or the, the people, I should say, in, um, in the in-person worship. My husband gave his testimony on the different paths that God has led him on. God had an ultimate plan for Ed that took him down some very difficult and rock bottom valleys. One was um, a tragic farm accident, and the other one was addiction. We realize now that this path that he was to walk was needed, and it has brought him to helping others now. And this is the best pathway for him. I know that there are some of you who are watching who have walked deep valleys and they and you have come through them stronger in praising God. Realize again that this is only possible because you heard these very words. I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. So another feeling then is to be guided. You're guided. You feel guided. And then we get into the verses about the mule, to which I say there is the feeling, or the action rally, I guess, of being stubborn. Hmm. How many of you have an experience that has involved a mule or a horse? 
And if so, was the animal well-behaved or stubborn and senseless, as the um, scripture says today? We have some good friends that um, have several mules. And um, our friend would harness them and connect them to the wagon, and he would take um, them then through his property which included many trails and a river bottom and up some hills, um, through some valleys, beautiful. Well, um, there was a time, a few times, where the mules wanted to go their way. And if you knew our friend Mike, he was stubborn too. And he had uh, realized that he had to put put just the right um, bridle and just the right bit on those mules to direct them the right way. So what is the lesson here? We can be stubborn and want to do things our way. We want to be stubborn and live life on our terms. And we want to be stubborn and ignore the gifts bestowed to us and take our life for granted. And we want to be stubborn and feel that going through the motions of being a good person and appearing as a Christian will assure us of salvation. David says right here, do not be like a senseless horse or mule that needs a bit in bridle to keep you under control. He is telling us to turn our will and our lives over to God. Now, two verses that seem to contrast each other happen to end the chapter. The wicked have many sorrows compared to the righteous who are surrounded by God's unfailing love. Don't get me wrong. Those who are righteous still screw up and choose to sin. He reminds us that they are the souls who confess their sins then. There is another place that the same message in verse 10 and 11 is given. It happens to be Paul's letter to the Romans. We must remember the Acts of Paul and the many letters that he wrote to various churches. In the second chapter of Romans, the 9th through 11th verses, they say this, There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, for the Jews and for the Gentiles for the Jews first, and then also for the Gentiles. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good, for the Jews first, and also for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. This message then is for everyone. The last part of verse 10 is about the feeling of trust. This is a vital feeling. One that comes after you have experienced something, you learn to trust it. In this situation, we are told of a reward for putting our trust in God, and that reward is unfailing love. The thought of God's mercy to those wrongdoers who don't deserve it, but who have confessed their sins, causes David to break out with a feeling of excitement in verse 11. And he's telling others about this excitement when he ends it by saying, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, all you who obey him. And there's yet that other feeling, that final one, which is gladness. The chapter is complete when the psalm says, Shout for joy all you whose hearts are pure. So that's a lot of feelings, lots of emotions. So allow me to just real quickly recap them. There are a dozen in all. We feel joy because our sins are forgiven. We feel tremendous guilt over unconfessed sins, but the Lord clears our guilt by his forgiveness. Stress is experienced if we're living with guilt, 
and it can be life altering. God's hand of discipline will also make the sinner feel weighted down. David's concern was about the lack of time for people's confession of their sins. So are you concerned? God is our hiding place, and we will feel protected. Friends, be assured God has a pathway for our lives. Allow him to guide you through it. Don't be stubborn and try to go your own way because it's only going to lead to trouble. It takes time, but a person who has put their trust in God will be rewarded. And then finally, excitement and gladness is yours, friends, when you are obedient to God. Amen. And let us pray. Almighty God, we are thankful for David, the psalm writer, who gives us Psalm 32 today. For focusing on the different feelings, some good, some bad, but some that are necessary to hear the message of forgiveness, of your unfailing love, and even for what is to come, and how the psalmist wrote to those people of Old Testament times, but also how it is spoken about in Paul's letter to the Romans. We pray with gratitude to you, Lord, for all that you have given us, for things that we do take for granted. We also lift up in this prayer today those who need you in special ways. For we know that there are people in our congregation, friends in this community who need you because of health situations. Some who have lost loved ones. Some who have lost jobs and are searching. We pray for the coming school year. We pray for the teachers and the students, the staff who work in whatever capacity within our school system. We pray also for the farmers who are preparing for the harvest. We thank you for the timely rains that this community has received. We pray for the ongoing conflict of war through in various places of this earth. As we normally do, Lord, we provide a time of silence so that anyone watching today can lift up their own prayer of gladness or their prayer of concern. So Lord, hear now our unspoken prayers. And now, Lord, with unified voice, hear us as we complete this prayer, saying the words of the prayer that we learned within your holy word, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I alluded to in my message, the closing song is When We All Get to Heaven. It is on page 701 in the Methodist hymnal. And then the sending video is um, one that asks the question, who am I? And it is by Casting Crowns. I hope you enjoy it as well. Please receive the, the benediction. May the love of God the Father, the sacrifice, 
sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, his son, and the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you throughout this week and always. Amen.